This story took place when I was 23 years old, close to 10 years ago. I was living in upstate New York in a very rural area with my ex-boyfriend and his family. He and I used to argue quite a bit. One morning before he went to work, he and I got into a very heated argument. He was 20 years my senior, but during this particular fight he acted majorly juvenile. He jumped out of bed, flipped me the bird, and yelled, If you don't like it so much, then why don't you go back to the fucking Bronx? That was all the prompting I needed. I threw on my Uggs and my winter jacket, grabbed my cigarettes, and flew right out of the house. I'm unfortunately an impulsive ass, and didn't think to grab my cell phone before I stormed out. I didn't drive, so my only option was to walk. I don't think at the time that I intended to walk all the way back to the Bronx, as I was a three-hour car ride upstate. I just needed to go on an angry, dramatic walk to let off some steam. I realized once I got to this road at the entrance of the trailer park that I had no idea where anything really was around me. I had only lived there for a few months at that point, and we didn't really exactly go out a lot. I banked left and just walked and walked where I knew civilization was. I found myself walking alongside a very busy stretch of road with 18 wheelers flying by, spraying me with slushy snow and soaking my shoes. I saw my then boyfriend driving by on his way to work. He sped up as he drove past me, evidently still very angry about our fight. I thought for sure he was going to turn around at some point, but he never came back. I pressed on, deciding instead to try and walk to my best friend's mother's house, which I knew to be in the same town. It started to snow pretty soon, though, and I was losing momentum. I passed by a VFW, where a nondescript pickup truck was parked in the driveway. It wasn't until I passed it that I even realized the driver was in the front seat. He called out to me. Hey, honey, do you need help? My stomach churned, realizing I would have to accept this stranger's offer. I approached his truck slowly and tried to weigh out my options. He was a clean-cut, seemingly normal, older white guy. Gray hair, greenish-blue eyes, very average. I don't know why, but I blurted out, Are you a good guy or a bad guy? I cringed at myself for asking such a dumb question. I'm a good guy. I wouldn't tell you if I was a bad guy. I ignored the bells going off in my head and hopped in the front seat with him. As we drove, I realized I had no clue where my friend's mom actually lived. I knew the name of the road she lived on but it spanned a good distance, so it wasn't very helpful in terms of finding my destination. I asked to borrow his cell phone so I could try calling my best friend to ask her where the fuck I was going. I called her three times, and she didn't answer because she didn't recognize the number. I started to feel inexplicably hopeless. After a few minutes, he asked me where I was from, and why I was out in the middle of nowhere in the snow wearing only pajamas, I explained that I was originally from the Bronx, and that I had gotten into a fight with my boyfriend. He paused for a moment and said, Hey, you wouldn't be interested in making a little money, would you? I chuckled nervously. Oh, uh, no thanks, though. Well, I just figured, since you said you were from the Bronx, and trailed off. Realizing at that point that I was almost definitely in some deep shit, I muttered, Oh, Sure, sure. He eyed me up and down and laughed to himself before sneering. I started to panic big time, but I knew I couldn't show my fear. I scoured the scenery for a pillowy snowbank that I could land in if I left out of the truck, but to no avail. The houses were so few and far in between. I became certain this would be how I met my demise. I'll never know why but it was at this point that he decided to ask me who I was going to see. I quickly blurted out my best friend's mom's name and her husband's full name. He instantly parked up and explained that he knew the husband, 
They used to snowmobile together 20 years ago. I felt the greatest wave of relief when he explained that he knew exactly where his old buddy lived. When we finally pulled up to that big yellow house, it was like arriving to the promised land. I sheepishly asked his name. Steve, he said. He then asked mine. I gave him a fake name, spat out a bullshit thank you, and ran as fast as I could from his truck to the porch. I crashed through the front door and locked it behind me. I immediately started crying and running through the house, trying to find my friend's mom. I had awoken her from a sound sleep, but she didn't say a word upon seeing how shaken up I was. Once I knew I was safe with her, I explained everything. The fight, the fleeing, the weird guy and his sexual proposition. She listened horrified and curious at the same time. She made me promise to never do anything so reckless again, and that if I needed her to just call her. She told me she would ask her husband when he got home about this Steve guy and find out more about him. I returned to my boyfriend's later that same day and got really stoned to try and forget about the events of that morning. The following day, my friend's mom called me to tell me that Steve was a very dangerous person who her husband had cut off communication with years ago. The last he had heard about Steve was that he had been arrested for sexual assault. She then went on to point out how easy it would have been for him to hurt me and lead me just about anywhere on some lonely stretch of road. No one would even know where to look for me, not to mention I might not have even been found until the snow thawed out. Upon sharing this post with the best friend of mine mentioned in the story, she reminded me that I left out a super unsettling detail. When her mom called, she was able to tell me Steve's last name. One of the first results on Google with his name, plus the town's name, brought me straight to a registered sex offender website with a mugshot of him. His eyes looked cold and empty, and I realized that with him being on probation at the time, he would have been especially eager to not have me get him in any further trouble with the law. Her mom said it best when she told me that I must have some serious guardian angels looking out for me. Sorry about the length, but this happened ritualistically and periodically throughout my whole life. It all started when I was probably about the age of nine in the summertime. My brother was a year younger than me, and long story short, he convinced me to go look for some cats that he had seen. I put my shoes on and followed my little brother out the door. We walked the streets in search of bastard kittens, completely unsupervised. I lived in a small town, and my mom worked at Pizza King until 9pm every weekday. My dad worked until midnight at Johnson Controls. That left our older sister, 13 at the time, to supervise us, but she was always off doing God knows what. Because of these circumstances, I realized later that we were perfect targets. Predictable schedules, lack of supervision, and comfortable in our tight-knit Midwestern neighborhood. My brother led me about six blocks away when someone called out to us. I turned my head to find four young men leaning up against an old gray two-door beater. They were standing outside of a known drug house. They were smoking cigarettes and seemingly minding their own business. The one who called out to us, closest to the passenger seat, asked us, Do you guys want some gum? I stopped dead in my tracks, and my brother looked confused. They offered us gum? It was eerily reminiscent of our yearly stranger danger assemblies in the school auditorium. My brother and I looked at them for a moment, but then turned around and started walking back the way we came, saying nothing. They yelled at us to stop, and we turned our heads and saw the driver getting into his car quickly, the passenger pulling the seat up to let the other two in the back. As the engine started up, we both ran. We ran through the yard of a man whose lawn was always way overgrown. We tried to crouch low to the ground and lose them, but the loud engine of that old beater was getting closer. 
It didn't occur to me that they could see the grass moving as we crawled through. I got up this time and ran at full speed, weaving in and out of people's yards to try and buy us some time. They followed us the whole way. When I realized there was no outrunning a car, we took a straight line to one of our neighbor's houses and started beating on their back door. The car sped out from around the corner and stopped abruptly in the driveway. We abandoned that idea and hopped over her fence. We eventually made it back to our house and thought we'd lost them. My mom's voice startled me from behind. Where have you been? Where's your sister? I think she had come home because she was on a delivery route that day. Sometimes when someone messed up a pizza, the owners would let my mom take it home to us if she was on delivery, so that we had something to eat when the pantry was empty. I started to tell my mom what happened. She didn't look like she was too keen on buying my story at first, until I stopped mid-sentence at the sound of a sputtering engine. I looked outside. The four men drove past our house slowly, looking into our windows and making eye contact, giving us a menacing look. My mom saw the men and tried to close the blinds. The track was broken, but failed. She told us to stay inside for the rest of the day. She left after that. I can't explain why, so don't ask. She just did. Later that night, still no sign of our sister anywhere, and we were hungry. We made some mac and cheese and put on Hannah Montana to get our minds off things. Laughing at scenes that weren't even funny, my nerves started to settle a bit. However, I kept on seeing this tiny red light in the corner of my eyes, coming from the window. I kept brushing it off. It could have been anything. After some time, I finally stood up and went over to the window to investigate. I saw that this red dot was actually the light of a video camera. I gasped at the sight of this, and the man holding it ran away immediately, towards another man illuminated by a street light down the road. Naturally, I panicked and cried. I ran outside and screamed my sister's name as loud as I could. I ran back inside. I called 911 first, then my mom. I told them that there were two men with what I thought was a video camera outside on the street. The police showed up after circling the area, said they'd stake out for a couple of hours at the house on the corner, but that the man would probably be long gone. They never did find the man, but the man found us, over and over again. A couple of years later, my brother had the neighbor's kid over for a sleepover. We all hung out in his room until late at night, laughing loudly and shooting BB guns at the ceiling and each other. I left the room, and when I came back, my brother had told me that a hand had slapped the window and slid down, just like in a horror film. I thought he was just trying to scare me, and I still believe he was probably lying. I was just in the middle of telling him how full of shit he was when I saw that little red dot again out of the corner of my eye, silencing all of us. We ducked to the floor at first, silent, unbreathing. Then my brother crawled over and turned off the light. We stayed there for a long time until waking our parents up, but they found nothing. I passed it off as a prank. Another couple of years later, in an insomniac-induced all-nighter, I was sitting in our sunroom, with big windows all around and no curtains, reading a book. It was about three o'clock in the morning, and the whole house was asleep. I had my headphones in, listening to my MP3 player, when I thought I heard a loud noise over the music. I looked up, startled, and I saw a man at the door watching me at three in the morning. This was the closest I had ever been to him. I froze and stared at him, he was about six feet tall. His hair was long and wavy over his eyebrows. It almost looked kind of like bangs or a comb over without enough gel. He was wearing a white hoodie and long blue pants that nearly covered his shoes. He looked like an aged up version of the man who had offered us a piece of gum years before. He had a blue digital camera in his hand down to his side. He walked away casually without fear or haste maintaining eye contact the whole time. 
I followed him with my eyes, past the windows, and behind the only window that was concealed with blinds out of my sight. I ran inside and told no one. I passed it off as a sleep-deprived hallucination for months, denying the nightmares and cold chills. I finally came to the realization. This was the man I had seen years before, and I remembered something. That door's lock was broken. Those weren't the only times we caught someone outside our windows. It happened for years, and it almost became an odd fact of life. He seemed to be less interested the older I grew, though. It's strange because he always purposely reveals his presence to me instead of trying to stay discreet. He even showed his face to me that one night. It makes me wonder what kinds of pictures and videos he's captured, how long he would watch before making himself known to us. I used to convince myself that these were several unrelated instances because it scared me more to think that one person had the capacity to invest so much time into us. It seems like an odd revenge for outrunning him years before. A few years back when I was 19, I had just gotten my first apartment in the basement of an apartment complex. That might sound odd, but a friend's mother talked to the apartment's landlord to find me a cheap place to live. This was in Denver so it wasn't cheap for a one-bedroom apartment in most places. This is all relevant later. The basement apartment was a studio located at the base of a flight of stairs. It was the only apartment at the bottom of these stairs, between the apartment's boiler room and laundry area. Even farther down a brick hallway with a screen door, and landing before you finally got to my apartment door. The first few months of living alone were fine. There was a smoking area up the flight of stairs that led to my apartment. One day, I was up there having a cigarette, when a Native American man sat next to me and also started smoking. He was a resident in the apartment. His name was John. John seemed mostly normal, maybe a little lonely, but nothing unnerving. He said he lived alone and he was an artist. We chatted until my cigarette was through. I said goodbye to John and went back downstairs. I would see John occasionally, smoking, as I was going to or from work. He always just said hi to me and never gave off any red flags, which makes all this all the more creepy. One night, as I was laying there asleep, I woke up to the sound of the doorknob to my apartment jiggling. It was like someone was frantically trying to break the lock. I got out of bed and immediately grabbed a knife from the kitchenette. If this had been a normal room in the apartment complex, someone would have heard the doorknob rattling, but my apartment was secluded on the subterranean level. I stood right next to the jiggling doorknob and said, Hello? Who's there? No one answered. I looked through the peephole, but it was way too dark to see. I said to the door in a loud and confident voice, if you come in here, I will kill you. I was serious about it too. Back then, I was pretty fearless and in a not-so-great mental state, just explaining because some people questioned my reaction to this event. The jiggling immediately stopped. Whoever it was booked it back through the screen door, down the hallway, and up the dark flight of stairs. I don't know if they thought I was asleep until then or what, but I think I scared them. I could see their dark outline going up the stairs through the peephole, but I couldn't make out the person's features. I made a mistake that night when I decided not to call the cops. I felt like it would be a hassle, and that it was probably just some drunk person causing a bit of mischief. My heart was pounding from the adrenaline, but I felt confident I could take care of myself, and I mostly put the incident out of my mind. About a week later, very late at night, at around 2 a.m., I woke up and realized the door to my apartment was wide open. I was in shock. I couldn't really process what I was looking at. I walked towards the door, wondering how someone could have just come and left while making no sound. I remember my heart was beating furiously, and it was difficult to breathe. 
every footstep felt like I was walking further into a fatal danger zone. I examined the door. The doorknob had been completely removed from its socket. I don't know how he broke the doorknob out of there without waking me up. I've entertained many possibilities. Maybe he used a knife and carved it out. Maybe it wasn't fastened securely in the first place, and it just popped out on accident. But it held pretty sturdily when he was jiggling it the week before. I'm a fairly light sleeper, so I just don't understand how he could have done that. It still bothers me to this day. There was a clean hole where the doorknob was mounted to the door, and the doorknob was gone. I never did manage to find it. The kitchen knife I had threatened the intruder with the week before was lying on the ground next to my bed. Maybe I'd gotten up and put it next to me in my sleep. I don't know. It's all a mystery to me, and that's why this occurrence still bothers me so much. I just can't figure it out. A person had been in my room, possibly watching me sleep for a while, but they had left without doing anything bad to me. I'm lucky, I guess, but I'll never really know why. I bought a deadbolt for the door and had the doorknob replaced. Since people will probably ask, I did not call the cops. Like I said, I was in a very bad mental state. I didn't really have a lot of energy to care about myself, but that's besides the point. I was really on edge for the next few weeks, but nothing happened until a few weeks later, when the guy tried to break in again in broad daylight. He was doing his doorknob jiggling routine again. I looked out, and I saw this time that it was John, completely drunk. I know because I yelled at him, and he scurried drunkenly back up the stairs just like the first time. Apparently, he was known for having a bad drinking problem. After that time, the entire complex knew what he'd done, and the owner of the building urged me to press charges. I believe they also evicted John. I didn't press charges, however, for the aforementioned reasons. I moved out very shortly after anyway. Like I said, the unanswered questions still haunt me. What did he want? Was it him that broke in? Was it all just a nasty trick my own mind played on itself? I'll never really know. Many years ago, when I must have been in about grade 5 or 6, my parents started working more, leading to me having to catch the bus and walk the rest of the way back home. There was nothing bad about this, and I enjoyed the walks quite a lot too. I'd been doing it for about a year, and each day I noticed the same man parked in a driveway with his dark blue ute and almost every time a cigarette in his mouth. I saw him two days in a row the first time, and thought nothing of him. A few days passed without me seeing him. Then the next week I walked past the house and his car was there with no one in it. I felt uneasy walking past it though, and as I did I noticed a camera poorly hidden away, just in front of the steering wheel. I pretended not to notice it, but in my head I knew exactly why it was there. For the rest of the week, that camera was there. At the end of the week, he'd sit in his car and check his watch as soon as I walked by. He was trying to figure out the time that I came past him. I wanted to take a different route home, but I couldn't really do much else, as the only way would always inevitably result with me walking past this house. For maybe a month, He'd be sitting in his car staring at me each time. I still don't know if he thought I couldn't see him because he was really bad at being discreet. Then one day he was leaning on his car door. As I walked past, he said something along the lines of, Hey mate, you need a ride home? Obviously, I said no. He kept on trying to get a yes from me, but I never stopped refusing. I could tell he was getting mad and he could tell that I knew too, so he calmed down and told me sorry. The next day, I see his ute drive up behind me. He slows down as he comes next to me, and rolls down his window, asking me if I wanted to ride again. He drove off the first time I said no this time. 
it goes maybe a week or two without seeing him. After I thought I wouldn't ever have to see him again, suddenly he drives past. He asked the exact same question, and when I refused, he just told me to get into the car. I said that I wasn't getting in, that he can leave me alone. He changed his tone a lot, and that's when he told me he had a gun. I lived in a small Australian city, and the chances of him having a gun are next to zero. It was easy to tell he was trying to scare me. He then played it off as a joke after I was unfazed, and leaned over to open the door. Get in, mate. It's much better in here than out there where it's hot. I've got air conditioning. It's 38 degrees Celsius outside, you know. You probably know all about stranger danger and all that, but I promise that's not who I am. Hop on in. I remember that word for word, and it scares me to think of that to this day. No, my house is right here. Leave me alone, please. The only problem was, my house was still half a kilometer away at the very least. I proceeded to walk up to a random house's driveway and knock on the door. I had no idea who these people were. He stared at me as I waited for the door to open. I heard the doorknob turn, and before the person could even say anything, I bumped past them and got inside. Now that I think about it, it might have been just as dangerous to enter a random person's house than a random person's car. The man's expression changed, and he sped off after the house owner glared at him. The owner was a very nice old woman. I told her that he tried to convince me to go into his car. She called my parents right away, and I waited outside of her house for them to arrive. My mom was so grateful, and my dad was pretty much in shock. My mom then constantly visited the old lady, as she lived alone and she wanted to be nice. I never really thought as a kid about how lucky I was that the house I entered wasn't the wrong one to go into. I try not to think about that whole experience, because it all genuinely terrifies me. I don't know what happened to the man, never saw him again, and I definitely don't miss him. What is up guys, Blue Spooky here, as always. Thank you guys so much for watching, especially if you made it this far to the end of the video. I hope you guys are enjoying this sort of daily upload thing. I'm trying to upload as much as possible while I still have the time to, mostly because I find it fun and there's not much else to do while COVID is around. So I hope you guys are enjoying that. If you guys like the video, please be sure to like, share, comment, and subscribe if you feel so inclined. Uh, these stories were all submitted to me through my email by subscribers. If you guys would also like to submit stories for me to read in the video, please be sure to take a look in the description below. It will have links to all my social media, including my Facebook, Gmail, and Twitter accounts. You can go ahead and send me a message on any of those, and I'll try to get back to your story as soon as possible. If you do decide to send in a story, please be sure to include as much detail as you feel comfortable with so I can make it a nice, healthy, long video. Also, please be sure to include in the tagline what the name of the story is, if it has one, the theme of the story, if it has one, and how you would like to be credited in the description of the video the story appears in. Also, make sure you use proper grammar and spatial paragraphs and all that stuff, because it's kind of hard to read wall of text submissions. Uh, if you guys are new to the channel and you like this, I have two other channels, one where I do disaster documentaries, and another one where I do true crime videos. I do both of those once a week. You'll find links to those in the description as well. Those are called Mr. Blue Skies and Darkest Hour, respectively. A special thanks to my artist. His links to his social media will be in the description below. He does all of my artwork for this channel, and he does the thumbnails as well. If you like his art, so you can check his social media out, and he'll be able to get you something real cool if you're in the mood for that. If you guys are curious about the music, it's listed in the description below in the order which it appears with links to the artists. Uh, other than that, I think that's pretty much it for now, guys. Thank you guys so much for watching, and I hope you guys have a great day.